Welcome to chapter five of the Wealth Management Essentials course. In this chapter, we will be talking about consumer lending and mortgages. So there are six different learning objectives in this chapter. Uh, it's going to revolve around credit planning, residential mortgages, key financial factors to consider when purchasing a home, methods of reducing interest costs and penalties, and related mortgage topics and financial planning issues. So first we're going to look at credit planning. So there are some advantages to consumer credit. First off, it reduces the need to carry large amounts of cash. It simplifies payment for diverse purchases. It can be used for cash flow planning by providing monthly statements of expenses that can be monitored. I know for myself, I use my credit card for just about everything. So I just know how much I spend on an average month. It also allows the borrower to take advantage of bargains when cash is limited, and it can provide a temporary fund for emergencies. Now, obviously, there are some disadvantages of consumer credit. It increases the temptation to spend as soon as credit is available. It may lead to impulse purchase of items that are not needed, and if the credit is at max, then emergency result reserves is nullified also, the interest rates on uh, credit, they can be pretty high, uh, and that can really be difficult to get out of that, that situation. Now, there are various different forms of consumer credit. Uh, so first off, you have overdraft. Uh, it's, specif it's a specified limit at which you can overdraw a checking account, and it typically is charged at a high interest rate, uh, actually the highest interest rate. Uh, of all uh, consumer credit options. Um, basically, it's a temporary loan, and depending on the institution, the period may be 30 to 90 days. A credit card is issued by financial institutions. There is also plenty of uh, credit cards issued by retailers that have uh, sometimes have reward programs, and they also have a really high interest rate similar to uh, overdrafting a checking account. You also have a charge account. This is offered by few retailers. They are accounts with uh, revolving credit, meaning the borrower can reborrow, but the balance must be paid within a specific or a specified time. You can think of this similar to just accounts receivable. You will have a lot of um, a lot of uh, businesses uh, basically uh, give other businesses tabs um, that they just have to pay off after 30 days. Um, so it's basically just a charge account. Then you also have a personal line of credit. So it's an open revolving loan that allows clients to reborrow funds without having to reapply for the loan. A line of credit can either be secured or unsecured. If it is secured, it is guaranteed by an underlying asset, um, usually a house that turns it into a home equity line of credit. Um, uh, but basically uh, you can borrow as much as you want on this loan and you can pay it back whenever you want. The rate usually is floating, um, but it is also a fairly high rate, uh, definitely not as high as uh, the credit card or overdraft. There are some other forms of credit. A personal loan is a type of installment loan. It ha usually has a fixed term um, and it is set by which the funds borrowed must be repaid in full by, that, uh, by the end of that fixed term. It can either have a fixed or a variable interest rate and is granted for specific purposes like for a vehicle or sometimes to consolidate debt. There's also uh, what's called a demand loan. So this is a short-term loan granted with plenty of collateral. The interest rate is variable and full repayment may be demanded by the lender at any time. You can also get a residential mortgage, so that's just a traditional mortgage on a home. Uh, the amount is based on the value of the property and the borrower's ability to repay the loan. You also have home equity lines of credit, which I did touch on. Basically, it's a line of credit, but it is uh, secured by your home. So if you aren't able to pay the line of credit um, and have to default, then your home is on the line. They can take that to pay the line of credit. Um, but uh, essentially, it merges that line of credit and mortgage and it does allow you to have a bit of a better rate than the line of credit. Usually it's a bit of a higher rate than a traditional mortgage, um, but it's a pretty good uh, way 
of having some uh, flexibility in terms of emergency savings. Now, when the financial institution is giving a loan or debt or mortgage or anything, they need to assess a client's ability to repay the credit. So they do this by looking at three main things, one being affordability, so they consider the borrower's present and future ability to handle their financial obligations. They usually calculate two debt service ratios that determine the amount of debt that borrowers can afford to carry. They must also pass a stress test, which calculates their ability to pay debt if interest rates climb higher than the current average. And uh, actually recently, just because it has been uh, one of the time periods in history where interest rates have gone up the fastest, um, it actually went up higher than what they stress test some of the mortgages at. So um, it is really good that they do that. Uh, it has been a unique scenario in the past few years where interest rates have gone up you know, so you know, historically fast. Um, and it caused a lot of people or, and will cause a lot of people to have their mortgage payments renew at very high rates, much higher than they initially got them at, which can be a cause for concern and uh, could eventually lead to uh, them not being able to pay the mortgage and defaulting on the property. Uh, but another, uh, another thing that uh, financial institutions look at is credit history. Um, so this uses the five C's of the credit approach character, which refers to honesty, reliability, and repayment history. Capacity refers to the client's ability to repay the loan based on their current income, job stability, assets, etc. Credit refers to the client's past credit history, which is an indicator of how debt may be handled in the future. Collateral refers to the property that can be used to secure the loan, and capital refers to net worth of the client and their general financial uh, situation. And finally, they also look at the client's credit score. So this is a numerical value based on statistical analysis of the borrower's information. It ranges between zero and 900. An average credit score is around 650, and a score between 620 and 680 is generally required to qualify for a mortgage. Now, uh, just looking at the primary mortgage market. So this refers to the retail source from which borrowers access funds to buy real estate. Uh, chartered banks concentrate on loans for single family housing and uh, banks restrict mortgage loans to an 80% loan to value ratio. This means that loan, uh, the loan can consist of no more than 80% of the property's value. Sometimes a higher uh, loan to value ratio may be permitted if the borrowers have insurance to cover the debt. Credit unions and other cooperators share a spot in the market and compete with the chartered banks and also trust companies, life insurance companies, pension funds, etc. They can hold retail mortgages as investments. And borrowers who make the down payment uh, of less than 20% of the purchase price of the home they're uh, deemed to more likely default. Therefore, they must have some mortgage loan insurance against the risk. Um, so usually they have to go with CMHC and that uh, increases their payment uh, a fair bit. Now the secondary mortgage market, uh, this is where existing mortgages and blocks of mortgages held by lenders are bought and sold uh, mainly for investment purposes. The original holders, such as banks or trusts, sell these investments to pension funds, private investors, or institutions. And lenders sell mortgages as part of managing their capital investments, cash flow, and to maintain profitability. There are also what's called uh, NHA insured mortgages, which is National Housing Act mortgages. Um, basically, they are a government sponsored way for lenders to generate funding for default insured mortgages. Um, so they trade near the level of government bond interest rates since they are considered a low risk obligation. And unlike bonds or stocks, mortgages are not uh, homogenous, which means that they are all different. The underlying security on the mortgage is real property, which is illiquid. And since financial institutions offer negotiable prepayment terms, uh, the prepayment stream is unpredictable, which is why mortgages were deemed unattractive investments in the secondary market 
and this eventually resulted in mortgage-backed securities. So a mortgage-backed security, uh, they're typically um, fixed rate investments that represent ownership in pools of mortgages that have been securitized. It is essentially a group of mortgages that are resold to institutional and private investors. Uh, CMHC introduced the NHA at mortgage-backed securities in 1987, which applies a guarantee on timely payments. So the securities are then sold to investors who receive monthly payments of interest and principal. Mortgage-backed securities still carry the risk of prepayment, however. Um, this risk is pooled with a group of mortgages, so it makes it not as bad. Um, and they do still differ from bonds by paying a proportional share of the interest and the principal payments associated with the underlying mortgages. So you can sort of think of mortgage-backed securities as just this big pool of mortgages uh, that you can buy, similar to a fund that uh, just has a bunch of different mortgages in them. And so it does, uh, does lower that risk of prepayment, um, which is why they became fairly popular. Next, we're gonna look at some key financial factors to consider when purchasing a home. So as we mentioned, um, I talked about the loan to value ratio. So it is calculated by dividing the amount of the loan by the value of the property, and it is expressed as a percentage. So with a more conventional mortgage, the borrower provides a down payment of 20% or more. With a high ratio mortgage or insured mortgage, the borrower provides less than 20% and they must pay additional fees for mortgage loan insurance, um, mainly for that CMHC. There's also the gross debt service ratio, which is fairly important. Uh, it's a standard measure of credit worthiness and it is calculated on a monthly or annual basis. It's calculated by adding the mortgage payment, property taxes, heating costs, and 50% of any condominium fees, if there are any, and then dividing it by the gross family income. Ideally, the GDS ratio should not be above 32%. So essentially, a family should not be paying, or not be putting 32% or more of their income towards payments or just expenses uh, involved in the house. Total debt service ratio, this is closely linked to the capacity principle from the five C's of credit. So it's calculated as the mortgage or rent payment uh, plus the property tax plus the home heating cost and 50% of the condominium fees. So same as the gross debt service ratio. But they also add the minimum required debt payment and then divide it by the gross family income. So the maximum TDS ratio is generally 40%. If it is higher, that's sort of a red flag and it may be a reason why they don't uh, offer the mortgage. Just a few examples of this calculation. So with the gross debt service ratio, you look at the uh, total shelter cost. So with the gross debt service ratio, Again, you look at the mortgage payment. So in this case, it's the 7,574. You add the property tax and the heating costs, and then you divide it by the total annual gross income for the household. So in this case, it's 23.75%. So uh, that's fine. It's below 32%. So that, that would be red flagged. Then you look at the TDS ratio. So this is the uh, same thing, so the total shelter cost. But then you also add the minimum required debt payment from all different debts. So looking at the consumer credit card debt, uh, the, the minimum on that is 7,200, and the annual car loan payment is 2,400. Um, so that actually puts the total uh, debt service ratio above the 40% which does uh, go off and, and show a bit of a red flag. It may be a reason why the company might not offer the mortgage. Now, just a little bit more information about the mortgage stress test that I mentioned earlier. So it was brought in by the OSFI in 2018 to ensure stability in the mortgage marketplace. The borrower would have to qualify for a mortgage if the rate was higher uh, than 5.25% or the borrower's mortgage rate plus 
Uh, typically, uh, the mortgage stress test is not applicable to renewals unless you're changing a financial institution. So that stress test is usually only done uh, when you are first applying for the mortgage or switching to a financial institution. And the stress test, it does have a uh, direct impact on both uh, the GDS and TDS ratios. Now, we're going to look at term and amortization periods. Uh, it is pretty important to know and distinguish the differences. The term period is how long the lender will match an interest rate on the mortgage unless the borrower gets a variable rate. So quite often in Canada, people get a five-year fixed rate. So that means that they're their fixed rate is locked in for five years. The amortization period, that is the time required to pay the mortgage off completely. So sometimes might be people might get a uh, five-year fixed mortgage for 25 years. So it will take 25 years to pay off uh, that mortgage. And so you can see in the uh, table here, um, it just shows if someone took out that mortgage at 25 years versus 15 years, and you can see that the monthly payment is uh, a fair bit different and that you are paying a lot less interest over the lifetime of that mortgage. Next, we're going to look at some fees incurred in buying a property. So first off, you have the CMHC insurance fee. That fee is only required if you put less than 20% down on the, uh, on the property. Um, if you do put 20% or more down, you don't have to pay that CMHC insurance fee, um, which does save you quite a bit. There are appraisal fees, inspection fees, uh, land transfer tax, and some other taxes. There's also local development charges, fees for professional assistance and certifications, and plenty other miscellaneous closing costs, including inspection, real estate fees, tax, etc. Um, so you can see there are a lot of different fees in buying a property. Um, so just something to be aware of. Now there are a few methods of reducing the interest costs and the penalties. So uh, you can make accelerated payments. Obviously, if you pay more on the mortgage faster, you're going to be paying less interest over time. Sometimes that makes sense. Generally, I find it uh, depends on the interest rate. The interest rate is quite high you're going to want to pay off that debt as fast as possible um, but if it is lower uh, say less than what you would make um, through investing on an after-tax basis then it might be better uh, to invest but uh, some methods to reduce the interest cost uh, one is accelerated payments so you can do accelerated bi-weekly payments basically you're paying the semi-monthly payment 26 times a year so normally if you're paying semi-monthly, you're paying twice per month um, and uh, that means you'll make 24 payments throughout the year. But if you do it on a bi-weekly basis, that's 26 times. So you're getting an extra two payments per year. You can also do accelerated weekly payments, which is the regular monthly payment divided by four um, and you're making that 52 times a year instead of the normal 48. So this can uh, save some interest over time. You can also do prepayment, so an open mortgage has no restrictions on prepayment, but quite often you have a closed mortgage and it does have restrictions. Most financial institutions allow a lump sum payment between 10 and 20% in a year, and any more causes a penalty. There are also a few other mortgage topics to be aware of. You can uh, get reverse mortgages, they are quite rare. Basically, it's the opposite of mortgage. It can be used to withdraw equity from your home, usually in retirement, but it is quite risky um, because you are drawing income from your home and eventually you could draw it all out and then you're out of luck. You, you don't even own your home and you don't have an income stream anymore. So it is quite rare to do that, um, but it has been done for some people. There is the home buyer's plan. Uh, so this uh, allows people to basically withdraw from their RSP to buy or build an eligible home. Um, so each partner in a couple can withdraw the maximum, which is 35,000 for a total of 70,000. The downside is that you do have to repay that, uh, that loan into your RSP within 15 years, and you won't get the deduction again. You're just putting the money back. 
So it isn't a super helpful thing in my opinion. Um, it, it might be helpful if interest rates are quite high, but uh, um, it isn't uh, you know that beneficial because you do have to end up paying it back. Another option though, uh, which is brand new, is the tax-free first home savings account. So it is a new account that is available for first-time home buyers, and it combines the benefits of the tax-free savings account and the RSP. You must be a resident of Canada, age 18 or over. Eligible people will be able to contribute $8,000 per year, up to a maximum limit uh, throughout your lifetime of $40,000. So like an RSP, um, you do get the, uh, the deduction when you are contributing to it. Um, but it's also like a TFSA, so the growth and the withdrawals from the account are tax-free when it is used to buy a first home. Uh, another key thing in the uh, chapter is uh, self-directed mortgages. So clients can use their existing RSP as a source of mortgage funds to buy a home. Uh, this must be arranged with a trust company to advance funds from their self-directed RSP for their own mortgage. Clients cannot charge more or less than the current market interest rate and monthly payments must be made to the RSP. Uh, you should also consider the client's age and proximity to retirement, uh, principal balance of the mortgage and amortization period when you are uh, looking at this. Um, of course, with an RSP, people have to start drawing out of it, um, I guess the, the year they turn age 72. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind and you wouldn't want to to do this for a client that is approaching that um, But it is a, a rare option that some people um, might look to do Another topic that we touched on a bit is real estate as an investment uh, This includes rental properties mortgage-backed securities, which we talked about there are also some mortgage type mutual funds and uh, real estate investment trusts or REITs REITs, it is a securitized investment vehicle in which investors own a portion of a portfolio of commercial real estate. So the income generated is distributed to uh, REIT unit holders, uh, retaining its original nature. So it is either interest income or capital gains if it was sold. REITs offer income and the potential for capital appreciation as well as liquidity. So again, bringing it back to the learning objectives, uh, you could probably go through them and uh, you should be able to answer uh, all the questions with the learning objectives. I really hope you found this chapter helpful and I will see you all in the next chapter.